This uh, Battle of Ideas session uh, is entitled Design of People, Is Technology Making Us Less Human? Uh, the question we're grappling with uh, in this session is, in a nutshell, what it means to apply deliberate decision making. It can be therapeutic, it can be pragmatic, it can be simply uh, aesthetic. What it means to apply deliberate decision making uh, to things that might be thought of as integral parts of our humanity, our identity. Uh, as humans. It could be aspects of our body at the microscopic, uh, molecular or cellular, cellular level, uh, all the way up to prosthetic limbs, uh, from the beginnings of our lives uh, as embryos, right through to being autonomous adults. Uh, it could be aspects of our minds, uh, either individual minds or some sort of a hive mind. Uh, and it could be many different variations and permutations of those things. And what you think the ramifications are uh, of those sorts of uh, decisions uh, depends on what you think it means to be human, the relationship between our biology, our society, uh, and our humanity. Um, on my far left, spatially, maybe politically, I don't know, uh, <laughs> we begin with Marilyn Monk, um, whom I know well from my day job at the Progress Educational Trust. Uh, Marilyn's Emeritus Professor of Molecular Embryology at the Institute of Child Health. She's therefore intimately familiar with the workings of the human organism, from its earliest and its smallest beginnings, um, and her work has been responsible for several major changes in thinking uh, in molecular biology, in early development, in cancer. Um, in 1983, uh, uh, she disproved an understanding of the continuity of the germline that had prevailed for a century uh, beforehand. In 1987, uh, she was one of the people who discovered a deprogramming mechanism uh, without which we would never have things like induced theropotency and regenerative medicine uh, that we have today. So we're very pleased to have Marilyn. We then have on my immediate left uh, Daisy Ginsberg, uh, who's an artist and a design fellow uh, at Synthetic Aesthetics. Now, Synthetic Aesthetics, it's a tongue twister. It's an international research project uh, that's run by the University of Edinburgh and Stanford University. Um, and it's a project that investigates the connections between synthetic biology uh, and art and design. And, and Daisy lectures and publishes internationally. She's been involved in a whole number of interesting artworks and projects. I urge you to look them up. Uh, on the Battle of Ideas website, indeed on her own website. Um, this year alone, she's been a finalist in several awards, and in fact, just on Wednesday, she won uh, the World Technology Awards for Design. And my immediate right, we have Susanna Soares. Now, Susanna is the person who originally came to me with the proposal uh, for this session and who worked with me to put it together. I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, she's a senior lecturer in product design at London South Bank University. Uh, she's held positions at Goldsmiths University of London and here at the Royal College of Art. Um, and like Daisy, Susanna lectures and publishes internationally. Uh, her work's been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It resides in the permanent collection there. Um, also in the National Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, the Science Gallery in Dublin, uh, and the Royal Institution and the South Bank Centre here in London. And then last, but by no means least, uh, we have Andy Mia, who is Professor of Ethics and Emerging Technologies at the University of the West of Scotland, uh, where he's also Director of the Creative Futures Research Centre, um, and what that does, I quote, focuses on the big picture questions that affect the future of humanity, which is exactly the sort of thinking uh, that we like here um, at the Battle of Ideas Festival. Without further ado, Marilyn, can I ask you to kick us off? Well, I'm a scientist, a biologist, and I work in a lab, and I, I've been most of my life a molecular biologist, and halfway through my career I was shifted into early development. Now, just briefly to define these areas, molecular biology is a study of life at a subcellular level. So it's a study of our genes, the DNA of our genes, and how they're switched on and off, how they're programmed, the field of epigenetics, and the proteins that they code for, which are the building blocks of the cell, the enzyme that catalyzes the metabolism, and the proteins that make specific cell function, nerve, muscle, gut, and so on. There's about 100 different cell types in the body. And by developmental biology, we mean the, uh, the way uh, genes function at the molecular level that shape the embryo and the fetus and all the organs that, that uh, 
uh, that regulate development. Development can be studied in quite a number of systems, in worms and flies and frogs and sea urchins and so on, but the major model for human development is the mouse. And the mouse is also the model for human disease, what goes wrong, how it goes wrong, and how it can be put right. Now, one of the major problems when I shifted from molecular biology to developmental biology <coughs> is the fact that in molecular biology we have millions of cells, millions of bacteria and viruses, blood cells and so on. In development we have a single cell, a fertilized egg, it divides two cells, four cells, eight cells and so on. So this was a huge problem. So my major <coughs> contribution was to set about micronizing the molecular techniques, making them a million times more sensitive, sensitive to the single cell. And when we had those techniques available, we could ask and answer quite a lot of questions about gene regulation in early development. Now, an offshoot of um, one of the major developments, clinical developments from my single cell sensitive molecular biology was the uh, origin of what's called pre-implantation diagnosis or PGD. This is the diagnosis of a genetic disease in a single cell taken from an eight-cell embryo. It's available for couples who know they're at risk of having a child with a severe genetic disease that will cause the child to suffer and die early in life. And their embryos can be obtained by IVF, and then one can take a single cell from an eight-cell embryo, ask whether it carries the genetic mutation, that's under analysis, and then replace only a normally, a, no, a diagnosed embryo that's normal in the mother to initiate the pregnancy. And this procedure avoids abortion of a much wanted baby uh, that would have to be the case of a much later diagnosis like amniocentesis. Now, um, unfortunately, the press has labeled this procedure as designer babies, which is rather inappropriate, I think. But there are implications of eugenics, well, negative eugenics in any case, which is why up until now the procedure has been banned in Germany. And it's also banned for different reasons in certain Catholic countries. Um, there are ethical concerns when the procedure is extended to select embryos for other reasons rather than early disease of a child. And this is the case for diagnosis or selection of embryos, to avoid late onset diseases like cancer for families that carry the BRCA mutation or Huntington's or for sex selection if a family wants to have a boy or a girl. Sex selection is illegal in this country but is available in some countries in Europe. And also there's the rather ethically problematical situation of saviour siblings and this is where an embryo can be selected to be immunologically matched to an older sibling uh, who's likely to die from a severe disease, in which case the cord blood can be used from this second pregnancy to save the other child. Is this using the second baby as a commodity? Now, other areas that are relevant to this discussion are gene therapy and regenerative medicine. In gene therapy, uh, the patient suffers from some genetic defect or cancer or HIV AIDS, in fact. And in this case, cell, the, the genetic defect is corrected in cells outside the body in the laboratory and then the cells are returned to the patient. Or else the patient can be given an inhaler of the correct gene, for instance, in cystic fibrosis, hoping to correct the defect in the lungs. And this has been applied to... A, we're still in the clinical trial phase and there are various animal models for quite a number of diseases and prevention of cancer by actually genetically modifying the cells of the immune system to specifically attack leukemia or melanoma or in HIV AIDS modifying the cells of the immune system so they're resistant to infection. Now if I have time this other area Quickly. of importance is regenerative medicine and this is a, a situation where stem cells are used and in this case the um, the, the patient is uh, with the disease or injury is corrected by returning uh, stem cells to the site of injury or disease. The stem cells can be the patient's own stem cells and in fact regenerative medicine has been used for some time in the treatment of leukemia. But there are other sources <coughs> of stem cells that are being investigated and in some cases uh, 
cord blood cells, that's the cord that connects the embryo to the placenta, the fetus to the placenta, are being harvested and stored for later use to correct disease or injury. Okay? And the other case, of course, is um, uh, embryonic stem cells, which is rather ethical problematic if they're obtained from human embryos, but now scientists can create embryonic stem cells by putting embryonic genes into the patient's own cells in the lab. So I want to get from thinking about this idea of natural and unnatural. We know what's natural, what's unnatural, the stuff we make versus the stuff that already exists. But the boundary between the two is much fuzzier than, than what we think. If we think about plants and animals, the crops and foods that we eat every day, they're products of nature. They um, have been selectively bred as a part of our iteration towards progress in human development over the last 10,000 years. But new developments in synthetic biology, stem cell technologies, and other things that we're thinking about today could challenge this boundary further. So I've been studying synthetic biology as a, an artist and designer for the last four years, and synthetic biology is the idea that we can apply the engineering paradigm to make biology a material for design and construction of new systems and stuff. And to do this, you make biological parts out of sequences of DNA and can use them as almost like using the same model um, for electrical engineering to make circuits out of living things and program cells. So this idea is mostly being used for the promotion of um, bigger schemes like biofuels um, to produce cosmetics and ingredients for cosmetics and other pharmaceuticals that are expensive to synthesize chemically. And the difference that we could experience this with this technology might be really minor. It's just the shift in synthetic chemistry to synthetic biology. But there's other projects that are coming out that really could challenge the way we design ourselves. Um, one recent project is a uh, the engineering of bull sperm um, in Switzerland. And to me, this is a very Swiss design project. It's the idea is that you can encapsulate with the bull sperm, insert it into the cow's uterus, and you can trigger precision timed conception <laughs> because the, um, the hormones from the cow, uh, when she actually ovulates, they trigger the opening up and unpackaging of this capsule. So the farmer needs to know in less detail the, the cow's ovulation times and um, can save money. And the only outcome of this for us as consumers could be perhaps cheaper dairy. Um, but it also hints at where synthetic biology could go. Um, if we can do this to bull sperm, you know, will this be a technology that's available to us in the future? And what I want to ask is, are these technologies worth it for the perceived benefits? And what is this benefit that we're hoping, and that's to make a better world? We assume that technology is good and vital for our progress as, as humans and into civilization. But for me, the argument that evolution and progress can be aligned is dangerous. I think that making biology into a design discipline aligned to progress is a, a, dodgy, a dodgy idea. Um, because evolution responds to context. We assume that we're the, uh, like, we're the products of an iterative process of bettering. Um, but that's not necessarily so. That's progress in terms of technology. Um, we're, we respond to context. And our presence here is um, not necessarily we're not necessarily en route to perfection, although we like to think we are. Um, so my, um, one of the people I work with, Drew Endy, who's a synthetic biologist in Stanford, talks about how synthetic biology may allow us to free ourselves from the tyranny of evolution. Assuming that there is one, be one version of better when it comes to technology is problematic. And how will these kinds of new developments change the way that we see ourselves? And who's responsible for deciding what the idea of a better human is being? And Marilyn kind of highlighted some of these problems with this idea of negative eugenics. Um, and I want to ask everyone to think about how these new developments will change the way that we see ourselves. Um, and rejecting diversity in favor of the assumption that there's one version of better, to me, is problematic. Because the only way you could opt out of this technological revolution is to reject society. So is to reject it to be a, a Luddite um, or anti-technology? And are these the kinds of decisions that we want to face, or maybe our children or children's children will have to face, where you augment yourself just to fit in? But for me, this raises bigger questions about where we see the boundary between ourselves and technology, between what we make and what we are, and more importantly, where we want that boundary to be. Is technology making us less human? I think technology is definitely uh, changing and challenging our perception of what it means to be human constantly. And um, take, for example, the findings of Svanto Pabo, where he and his team discovered recently that Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals and form a um, whole new type of hominid, uh, sparking the debate about um, species and race. And perhaps we were always less human than we think. 
um, we have 10 times more bacteria cells in our bodies than human ones, and about half of our DNA is made of virus-like components uh, that significantly um, shape uh, human evolution. So does that classify us as, as uh, from a bacteria domain as well as from the anim animal kingdom or make us as hybrid uh, species? Um, the knowledge acquired over the last decade through advances in areas such as biotechnology, genetics, synthetic biology, as they um, mentioned, are challenging our very nature and nature itself. Um, and an example of that is the creation of synthetic life by Craig's Venture Institute. So we are um, intentionally designing and altering our physiological forms that inhabit um, our planet and shaping um, our own evolution. And has um, bioethicist bio Paul Wolpe described, for the first time in human history, uh, we have the power to design living organisms and body parts, including of humans. So um, technology is enabling us not only to manipulate our environment and the way we live, but al also our own flesh, and contributing greatly for the debate of post-human life forms, and this has become the concern of uh, artistic and design um, um, areas. And uh, as a designer that advocates the use of design to stimulate reflection and emphasize inquiry, I'm interested in the role that design and designers can play um, in shaping our future. And this has been fueled by a multidisciplinary discourse um, where designers are operating in a speculative field using imaginary narratives and objects to provoke debate, discuss future possibilities and uh, facilitate engagement. So designers are proposing um, to design cells, organs, body parts, plants, new species. So um, what I would like to take the opportunity um, in this debate is to explore the implications of um, these uh, engineered uh, biological systems and should or should not um, speculative design contribute uh, to this debate or stick to problem solving and the statics of consumer products. I want to um, first of all pose a question to all of you. Uh, in fact, could you all take out your mobile phones and hold them aloft? Don't switch them on. Don't switch them <laughs> on. Now Sandy doesn't have one. He quite proudly told me earlier today that he doesn't have a phone and he's resisting Twitter and all those sorts of things. Hold them right up high if you've got one. So that's probably 70, 80% of the audience. Now keep your hand up with your mobile phone if you think your, te your telephone is making you less human. Keep your hand up if you think it's making you less human. Oh. Making you less human, yeah. So we've got maybe 10 or 12 people in the audience that are, that are quite happy with the idea that that telephone is making them less human, yet they still keep it with them. Um, so, <laughs> so it seems to me that there is, as a philosopher, one t tends to tackle the, and, and reject the question, is technology making us less human? It seems to me one of the problems is that we might be comfortable with that. The other problem is that we don't really have a clear sense of what it is to be human in order to know whether, in fact, there's a loss or not, as arising from either molecular technology or, indeed, mobile phones, which I think there's an increasingly intimate relationship between the two. But hearing the others talk, there's clearly a way in which technology is changing the conditions of humanity. So you might be more in touch with people through a mobile device or a computer than you are face-to-face. -face. You might not have met many of these people face-to-face. -face. Um, but it seems to me there are a series of, of aspects of our humanity that are changing. But I'm certainly not going to claim that, in fact, we're less human because of technology. In fact, I'd also argue that we're not more human because of the technology. And it's an important distinction because there's a lot of metaphors around how we describe what's happening to ourselves through this technology. We're becoming post-human, transhuman, better than well. These kinds of concepts invite us to consider that we are changing in some radical or perhaps evolutionary way, which it sounds to me that we're not. Uh, however, the conditions of our humanity are changing quite considerably. And of course, they don't change in any linear sense. So many of you will have not been with your first mobile phone. This might have been your fifth, sixth, or seventh. And every time you get one, you've got to learn how to use it. And as time goes on, it's supposed to get easier, much like programming your television, but in fact, it gets harder. So there's a big gap between being able to use the technology and not. 
Um, but there are certain important ways in which those conditions of humanity are changing that cause, I think, not necessarily panic, but a sense of unease about what's happening. So I've written a few down as people were talking. It changes, as, as uh, Daisy mentioned, our concept of the natural, the boundaries between what we see of as ourselves and perhaps other species, either present or future, is, is changing. It affects our agency, our ability to perform the kinds of tasks we want to perform. Uh, it also changes the nature of our agency. So if you have a genetic test that reveals some kind of predisposition that could be detrimental to your health, that might also have a bearing on your siblings, for example. So our notion of kinship is changing as a re result of that kind of technology. It changes our conditions of solidarity. So take the same example. Should we all be required to commit our DNA to a public biobank? There's a very strong public uh, uh, agenda behind that that makes a very clear argument about its value. If we all contribute, then all of us contribute to increasing the knowledge about our DNA, which could translate into being able to treat conditions that we otherwise are unable to do so. So our solidarity is being changed as well as a result of them. Social mobility is also changing. So if you have the technology, then you might be one of the lucky ones, unless you don't know how to use it, which is a big problem. But nevertheless, it changes the conditions of the haves and the have-nots which is, of course, destabilizing aspects of our society. So there's a sense of, again, transformation that has significance. It also changed our notion of what's normal. You take um, South African runner Oscar Pistorius, a double below the knee amputee runner who's campaigned to be part of the Olympics and the Paralympics. If he's successful in 2012, or perhaps in 2016, and he becomes part of the Olympic uh, athlete population as well as the Paralympic, then his competition, his performance, could rad radically change how we see ourselves. What does it mean to be able-bodied now? Is it having two biological legs, or is it having two prosthetically enhanced legs? So it changes what we think of as normal as well. Uh, and finally, I want to come back to this concept of kinship, because it seems to me what's crucial about how technology does change humanity is the global context. So we already live in a, in a society where medical tourism takes place. What happens in a world where we have the ability to modify ourselves to enhance aspects of our abilities um, and go to different countries to undertake those kinds of performances. These issues are not just domestic issues anymore. There's a global context to these debates. So as for many of you, you don't see your telephones as reducing your humanity. You probably don't feel the same way about your glasses either, or your shoes, or your clothes, or the house you live in, or the electricity you consume. It seems to me that the, the question we need to be asking is whether the conditions, whether those aspects of our humanity are improving or not, not making us less or more human. You know, you, you said the natural and, and synthetic, um, you know, distinction is fuzzy, uh, and you talked um, about uh, biology being aligned to design as throwing up difficult, uh, difficult problems because of a lack of context. And I, I just think, are humans good enough to provide their own context? I mean, isn't that the whole point of wanting to uh, transcend our evolutionary circumstance? You know, this word culture comes, yeah. originally was a and exist in opposition to nature, why can't we create our own context and leave it all behind? Because I don't know if we're particularly good at it. Um, I think the last... How are we going to find out without trying? Well, I think we've already... I don't know. This is... Oh, that's a very big... <laughs> I'm a bit of a, a Luddite um, at the moment, purposely. And I think that there's this assumption that we are um, separate and to the rest of the living kingdoms. And if you look at the Tree of Life, which is a human-designed concept anyway to make, help us make... Um, sense of the chaos of the living kingdoms, mm -hmm. we are part of that very tree of life. And we, we sit within it. We're not separate from it. And one of my own projects has been to invent a new tree, of, a new branch of the tree of life, the synthetic kingdom. And this uh -huh. idea that we can put all of these engineered things that we're making, classify them separately into a synthetic kingdom. It's a very nice, neat engineering solution to an engineering problem of how we classify what's natural and unnatural, or just stick an extra branch on. But um, it's really problematic. But it also raises questions because it puts what we make into the same context as who we are and what we are. It puts those things back into nature. But this idea that we can separate ourselves or that we're somehow better than or an improvement on everything else, I think, is a very human-centric um, way of looking at everything that's alive and... Are you using that term human-centric as though that's pejorative? Because I don't necessarily... Well, I think it comes back to this idea of what um, we see as better. There's another project which is eradicating mosquitoes, um, like a development from the sterile insect technique. And we assume that, assuming, uh, that eradicating mosquitoes is great, but it's great for us. But is it necessarily great for an ecosystem? And we have to see ourselves, I would argue, as part of a wider ecosystem. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um,
talking of improvement, uh, I was very interested, Marilyn, you used the term um, negative eugenics. Daisy, Daisy then used it, um, which in a way I was pleased to hear because, you know, uh, one of the original definitions of eugenics, if I'm correct, is uh, it's the application of, of genetic understanding to improve the health of human populations. Not in itself a bad thing, some might say. Do you think that it, the, that concept can be rehabilitated or is it really tainted by our experience of eugenics in the 20th century? Um, I don't see this... I don't think of betterment, of, of using a mo genetic modifications or stem cell treatment or bionic limbs. I don't see, I don't see things from, from the point of view of making individuals better individuals. Mm -hmm. I actually see things in terms of alleviating suffering and disease. Um, and it, it's not... It's not a sort of a black and white problem. It's always the lesser of two evils or the greater of two goods. And it's also, although our laws are black and white, I mean, everybody is different in terms of how what their cutoff points, as it were. And in terms of embryo selection, I mean, obviously, if a family's been through the suffering and death of a child already and they want another child, then it seems to me you know, right that they should be able to avoid another suffering child. Mm -hmm. it, and again, there's a cut-off of point, what is suffering? You know, mm -hmm. early disease, uh, uh, you know, early death and, and the child suffering until death, it's obvious. But there are cases where people live very happily with genetic deficiencies, mm -hmm. you know, and should it be applied to um, Down syndrome or, 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 P or t autism or if there were a single gene uh, there isn't so far or schizophrenia if there were a single gene I mean it's it's very it's very difficult to know where to draw the line but you have to really think very carefully but I don't think in t I, I'm sort of against procedures that make individuals better individuals because mm -hmm. it brings up this all the problems of inequality <coughs> and education and health and insurance and law and employment mm -hmm. and so on uh, that's already those problems are huge I think I've probably answered your question uh, I think it's pretty good go um, I'm going to put the same question to both of you uh, Susanna and Andy you know you both said things that were quite closely connected you were saying Susanna perhaps we were always less human than we thought and um, it's interesting you know the Greeks had lots of different words for life um, one of them was psyche, but they also had the words zoe uh, and bios um, as a way of distinguishing between ni life understood naturally and culturally. Life on the basis of the fact that, we, that we, we live, we reproduce, we do things like other animals do, and life in the sense that we are, are social and cultural beings. So when we ask, you know, uh, is technology making us less human? You know, is to be human the same thing as to be homo sapiens sapiens? Are they analogous or synonymous categories, or are they in fact different? Um, Simple question for you, Suzanne. <laughs> I think we are very human-centric, you know, in the way we approach things. And um, and for example, there is a, a, um, a very comprehensive study running at, at the moment. It's about the um, the bacteria that live in our gut, and the, and, and apparently uh, it's quite connected with the way we think. In, you know, your whole body it works together. Uh, you know, if you don't have like healthy, enough healthy bacteria in your gut, it might affect you as mm -hmm. an individual. So um, I think we are quite centric, um, you know, human centric. And, um, you know, we, we detach ourselves from what's the, our environment and from nature. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of label us, uh, you know, humans and, and the species. And I think, you know, probably for around 200 years, uh, uh, the species debate is going on, and I think it should keep going on. Okay. Very quickly, Andy, what is it to be human? What are the kind of questions that people ask when they hear that? Am I, am I like that? Am I, do I prioritize the human species over all others? Are you sitting there thinking, do I care about other species? I, I think I do, don't I? I have dogs and cats and, you know, I maybe have adopted a goat somewhere. I mean, these are, these are ways in which people express their affection for other species. We enjoy the natural environment. So one of the problems with the question, again, is that the anyone, everyone but me does that. Uh, and I think a lot of people feel that way, that there's a kind of meta level where you can talk about how research undertakes uh, investigations to find out things that are for the betterment of humanity, whether it's the relief of suffering or improving our lifestyle conditions in some non 
essential way. So I think that um, there's a problem, and I say a shift certainly in other disciplines. If you look at artificial intelligence, the work in that area has shifted away from that kind of top down, the anthropocentric view of, of life, and, and tries to work, think about it from the bottom up. So I don't think we are, but we can look at this in another way as well. The concept of human is a political project. If you want to find out the definition of human, and you want a clear definition of it, go to UNESCO's Declaration on Human Rights. That is what enshrines our legal protection of the human subject. It's not perfect. It doesn't cover everything. And we know that partly because we've modified it or had supplementary declarations as a result of the genomic era. But it provides a way in which we identify ourselves and distinguish ourselves from other species. But the important point is that that concept of being human, the kinds of rights that you assume you're entitled to, or indeed you would argue for, are a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. You wouldn't have the same sense of, in fact, you wouldn't have the same sense of what it is to be human if you lived in China as, mm, you, as, as mm. if you lived in the UK. So these are political projects, the humanist project, characterized certain values that I think are being brought into question as a result of new technology. It's not a short answer, but I think the, the, uh, the idea of genetics has reminded us of the complexity of life, the, the inadequacy of individual autonomy as a guiding principle of how we should live our lives. The, kind, the idea that we are separate is, has been brought into question. If we answer the question that way, I would like us not to forget the Constitution uh, of the United States of America. It has, it has some things going for it that UNESCO doesn't. Basically, I just want to really attack this idea of being human-centric and why people genuinely think that's a bad thing. Like, look at us, look what we're doing. We, uh, we have the capacity for thought and we're enacting that knowledge and that's brilliant. There's, there's no other animal and no other species that can do that. So why, sh why shouldn't we do it for our own betterment and why should... Why should we not like degrade them for it? We are better, and that's brilliant. Pass it, pass it to this gentleman. I'd like to tackle this this word human slightly differently. I mean, to me, human uh, is a concept bound up with things like uh, humaneness, humanity, um, having time to develop your own individuality, uh, having time to cultivate relationships with family and with friends, and, and that type of idea of human. Now, um, I, I think there's a tension between the, the type of technological enhancement that is perhaps being discussed here and, um, and humanity in that sense. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, imagine you can take a pill or have an implant that will eliminate the need to sleep. I mean, that's perhaps, you know, not so far down the pipeline. Now, you, you get in a situation like that, there will be an immense pressure on people to have this implant or take this pill so they can be more productive economically. Um, employers will demand it. Um, people will spend even more time working um, uh, and, and will have even less time to sort of cultivate their, their humanity. And I, I wonder if there's that sort of tension uh, involved in, in the uh, technological enhancements. Yeah, I think, um, I think it is a mistake to not try to take this question on. Uh, what is it to be human, uh, sort of head on, and to, because um, I think Andy's or original kind of he he rose he brought the question up, and then he sort of stepped back from it a little bit and talked about the conditions of being human. Now, really, if we want to look at the conditions of being human, if we haven't got some idea of what hu what being human is, it's not going to be very easy to look at, say, questions of human flourishing. And I'll, I know it's uh, I, I won't be able to defend this here, but I think the capacity for reflective consciousness is something which is a good starting point, and it actually would bring us to some of the, the things that the, the guy in the front row was talking about as well. And I think if you look at the history of technology, even from cooking, you could argue that when cooking was invented, it, it, it made people not have to run after their prey for quite so long. And so they had more time to think and more time to be reflective. And I think as, as, a, as, a, as a very rough guide, that's quite good. And so if we're looking at any of these technologies, so, so for instance, even the sleep pill, if that meant you know, that uh, you had more capacity to be reflective because you weren't sleeping so much, maybe that would be a good thing. Maybe that wouldn't be such a... Maybe that's at least worth sort of considering. Isn't the use of technology to enhance our lives a very human thing? Isn't it a very essential part of our definition of what it is to be human in the first place? My point was pretty much what's just been said. Building, using, developing technology is intrinsically part of what it is to be human. Um, and following on from what Chris said, um, you know, being human-centric, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, also, part of being human-centric is that we also have protection of nature. I realise it's a fairly recent development in our evolution, if you like, but we do protect nature, we do have concerns about our environment, and that's something that's come about because we have the time and we have the, the, the cognitive abilities to recognise that we are part of a bigger system 
rather than just working on our own instincts. This, um, I'm, anth I'm anthropocentric, what of it, uh, is a little flavour of some of the comments that could do, that could do with uh, engaging with. Marilyn, can I start with you? Well, uh, I think I'd probably say the same thing, provided betterment doesn't create privilege and create a, a privileged class that, you know, as I say, in terms of education and health and employment, etc., if you're, it, it depends on whether it creates inequalities, you know, then mm -hmm. you've got the enhanced people and the non-enhanced people, and that always uh, bothers me because it's likely that, I mean, again, I would just come back that uh, it shouldn't be provided to enhance, but it should be provided for those who suffer so that bionic limbs that can be operated by thoughts, you know, wired up to your brain and mm -hmm. so on, it is absolutely wonderful for people who have spinal cord injury and paralyzed, but to be used to, uh, to the betterment to create privilege, I'm against. All right, so Daisy, um, I mean, pick up on what's been said, but does that answer your conundrum? You know, we can fix ourselves if we're broken as long as we don't try to all, you know, go beyond the original blueprint? I think it goes back to this question of betterment um, and the, the I'm anthropocentric, what of it, um, argument. I think I completely disagree that we think about nature. I think we are rubbish at looking after the world that we live in. And I don't thi I think that 99.9% .9 of the world doesn't think about it. And it is set into economic cycles that um, aren't necessarily going to be broken by new technology. But wouldn't, would we have medicine if the world that we live in had looked after us all right to begin with? Well, that yeah. comes back to different kinds of arguments. What I'm talking about is... The idea that sort of green fuels are green. I, don't, I mean, we need to consume less to allow more of us to survive. And so there's a different kind of argument, but I think that just assuming that we are awesome and the best and is possibly a dangerous way that we're all going to fit 12 billion people on the planet. Um, so that sets into a bigger argument about sustainability and this assumption that we're top of the food chain. Andy, are we awesome and the best? Um, well... Some of us are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the question is, a lot? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Yes. And it wasn't that question that I rejected. The question I rejected is, is technology making us less than human? I argued that it could neither be less or more, that it's making us different. The question about whether we can define it is an important one that we do need to take place. And I think the, um, the problem with, the, with your, your predicament is that the... Um, if you do neglect other things that sustain li our lives, then of course you're in trouble. If nevertheless you just sustain those things that are beneficial to us, then that might work out. If we have that technology, then why not use it to improve the cognitive capacities of other species? And then you're into a very different scenario where the kinds of rights that we neglect because they can't be articulated or we presume don't exist become much more real for us. Well, earlier on in the morning, we talked about dolphins and how intelligent they are. And um, there is a whole project on trying to communicate uh, with dolphins. So they are kind of tackling the dolphin language. And um, we want to learn more about it. And, you know, as far as I know, we don't know how intelligent they are because we, we only have us as a reference. Um, about technology, I mean, technology, um, um, I think... It's up to us to debate and discuss the benefits and the disadvantage of each technology, and if that makes ourselves better or not. Um, I mean, I don't think every technology makes us better, um, but some can be benef beneficial. But I think the point is uh, uh, it's up to us to um, be educated for and debate uh, those matters. Is in Improving or making something uh, closer to perfection necessarily a better choice for all of them, for all of us. And sometimes the overstatement of those things or the value of those things sort of make us um, off track with leaving the experience, which is really what makes us human. Excuse me if this seems to come across as a bit of a philosophical trick, as it were, but like if human beings create technology, and if creating technology is a human capacity, then can creating technology do anything less than make us more human? I just want to make a very, very quick point about quick. Um, your, your argument, Marilyn, about the problems of using these technologies and then having an unequal um, uh, you know, results that it'll increase in. It's a social problem. It's not a problem of the science. Technology 
um, allowed, allows people to have a longer lifespans and more productive lives, and that's we've seen people live longer, but that's still seen as a problem. Um, and how do we view um, aging and how people can play a part in society for a long period? I mean, do people, will there people be able to retire, or you know, it's, um, or do we expect them to just keep on working? And is there more to being human than just being a worker bee? Technology doesn't make us less or more human. I think that's more relative, in my opinion. I think technology just gives us an, another option. About aging, because um, I think that's one way to kind of characterise the debate as well, because there's you know, great hope to make us live longer through technology. But um, the way that it's kind of characterised today is, is a real sense of pessimism, because do we want people to live longer, more drag on resources and so on, rather than to kind of look at how more people you know, can fulfil uh, longer lives and contribute more widely to society. So there's no real sort of great sense of optimism even when we talk about technology in its kind of wider sense? With all new developments, with all knowledge, I mean, uh, we could, can be equally used for good or for bad. And it's not so much the knowledge that's the problem, but the implementation and regulation of the knowledge that might be uh, a social, long to a the more social aspect in the implementation and regulation, but I don't think we should divorce our new technologies from really considering how they can be used for good or misused or possible catastrophe. I mean, the stem cell and uh, genetic modification of gene therapy procedures are still at the trial period, although there have been about 100 trials, but they're mm -hmm. still not available to the, to the general public because there are huge fears of things that could go wrong. Your virus vector can pop out and cause cancer, or your stem cell can develop a tumor and, and so on. Fortunately, uh, science is, is really well regulated. We have our own institutional ethical committees and government ethical committees, and because of peer review, we're watching each other and so on. And so, I mean, we don't, I don't think that need we need to be afraid of what might happen um, because it's so, it is definitely regulated and watched what happens there. So, but I think we, should, uh, uh, we shouldn't divorce the possible misuse or possible catastrophe from the, dis from the new technology. We should be considering all at the same time. I said before I was a Luddite. That's not exactly true. But I think that um, we yeah, just right. need to be very cautious and to actually discuss what technologies are good for society and to differentiate between better for an individual and better for society because I think they're different things when it comes to things that we can't see which includes designing ourselves and I don't think I think it's potentially an inevitable thing that will happen but I think there's still we have choice of what we design and that's what makes us human um, yeah I think there is like probably two strands one it's like uh, that you know we should be improved and technology it's good um, and make us better and the other one is uh, technology might violate uh, our biological uh, integrity um, although I think we like Daisy said we need um, you know to decide or we need to discuss what's good and bad and who decides what's good and bad um, uh, in terms of technological improvements Okay, I don't think people get up in the morning and think, how am I going to enhance myself for the day's work? I think most of you get up in the morning and think, what will I have for breakfast, which is, of course, a luxury. Um, it seems to me that the, the, the predicament is not about what sorts of choices we make to use technology to make ourselves either better or worse, depending on how you see it. The predicament is that the way in which those technologies develop has nothing to do with us at all. They're funded through very significant research grants that lead to the concepts that lead to the eventual products that either help us or hinder us. So there's a clear um, kind of take-home message for me that the way in which we engage with technology has to be reconsidered. The point at which we are part of that upstream dialogue to think about what kinds of technologies would, would, we would like is crucial. However, there's a crucial rub to this argument, and it's, it's, it's within the book by Ed Tenner, why technology, when technology fights back. And of course, if we hope to design technology that will eventually be used responsible or will make us more human, we're, we're kidding ourselves. In fact, the way in which technology is often developed has nothing to do with the intentions that they were designed for. Often people adapt them, make them meaningful in their own particular way. So the expectation, the gambit that we have is to continue to develop it, hope for regulatory oversight that allows us to ensure that 
their technologies that are used responsibly and to benefit humanity.